Tonight we're here at the Blue Ball Lecture Theatre, Christchurch, to talk to Stephen Venables, a pioneering international mountaineer, celebrated author, and ex-student at Oxford. So Stephen, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here with you uh, tonight. Um, could you just tell us a little bit about what you do and what some of your uh, greatest achievements to date have been? I enjoy travelling, exploring, going to remote wild places, and that's what I've been doing for um, the best part of my life. And when I was here at Oxford, I joined the Mountaineering Club, and I got very keen on mountaineering. And in 1977, a group of us who recently left the university did our first expedition to Afghanistan. And that was the first of many, many expeditions to, to the Himalayas, to Andes, uh, Antarctica, all over the world, really. And in, in 1988, you climbed Everest with yeah. a, a group of three others. Um, but the way in which you climbed Everest was, was really rather special. Thank you. Yes, I think it was quite special. <laughs> um, what was interesting about our expedition was that there were just four of us. We did a very hard new route, which had never been tried before. Uh, we had no porters working for us, no one carrying for us on the mountain, so we did all our own work on the mountain. Mm -hmm. uh, and the other thing is we didn't use oxygen equipment, um, which means that at 29 and a bit thousand feet above sea level, there's not a lot to breathe, so mm. it's, it's very hard, very hard indeed. And that is exceptionally unusual by the standards of many people who, who climb Everest. Um, what's it like being above, above 21,000 feet in what is ominously termed the death zone? Yes, the death zone is a rather sort of melodramatic <laughs> term, for, for, which, which is a very movable term. I mean, the thing is, altitude can hit you at anything above sort of 3,000 metres. I mean, people can get altitude sickness in the Alps. Um, However, yeah, if you, if you go above six, seven, even 8,000 metres, you're at far greater risk. And uh, basically, the human body is, is dying. It doesn't like being up there. So, which is why most ascents of the world's highest mountain are made using supplementary oxygen to counteract that extreme thinness of the air. Now, one other member of the Mountaineering Society who is forever associated with Everest was Andrew Irvine, who was a, a student at Merton. Irvine uh, and his climbing partner George Mallory were last seen mm -hmm. disappearing into the mm -hmm. cloud on the northeast ridge of Everest, uh, and they failed to return tragically. Mm -hmm. No one to this day has ever found Irvine's body, and the debate is on as to whether or not they reached the summit. Do you do you have a view on that? Mm -hmm. Did he get to the top? No, I think it's highly unlikely. Mm -hmm. But from what I know of my own experience and of such evidence as I've read and heard about over the years, it seems to me the likelihood is that they they had a brave stab at it. They thought, this is too hard, we're too late in the day, we're not going to make it to the top before nightfall, and they turned back. The likelihood is that generally, at extreme altitude, your brain's befuddled. Uh, Mallory was famously a bit vague. There were problems with the oxygen sets. They set off rather late. The weather wasn't that good that day. The chances are it was all a big muddle, and sadly, there was a, a slip, a mistake, probably on the way down, and, and they died. Mallory was at um, Cambridge. Yes. Um, in your view, would you ever would you ever have a would you ever climb with a tab, or would the <laughs> the onus to cut the rope be too strong? <laughs> well, it, it's, it's a horrible thing to admit, but um, I think in my well, the generation probably slightly preceding mine, I have to admit, out of the British universities, I think Cambridge did slightly have the edge in in mountaineering terms. Um, there, there's something about Cambridge. It's not just mountaineering. They're they're a bit more pushy. The, the really, the real hotshot climbers were actually at Leeds University, and that's always had a, a, a long tradition of a, a very, very out, outstanding climbing. Now, you've spoken about the Alps and the Himalayas, which are very well known amongst climbers, but uh, you've also been to some places which many of us haven't heard of. Mm. Um, could you tell us a little about what it's like, for example, to climb in, in South Georgia, and, well, first of all, where, where is it? Yes, yeah, South Georgia, usually when you say I'm off to South Georgia, people look a bit puzzled and say, you know, there are terrorists there because they think it's somewhere in the Caucasus or they think it's somewhere sort of near Alabama. Um, and it isn't. It's a British island. Not many people realise that. The highest mountain in Britain is 8,000 miles away in the Southern Ocean, Mount Paget, And it's on South Georgia, which is about 100 miles long. It's, it's entirely mountainous. It's, it's some of the most spectacular mountain scenery I've seen. And it's mountains with, with penguins and whales and seals and things, so it's quite special. And does that remoteness uh, cause you to look at the expedition in a slightly different logistical way to climbing on some of the greater ranges? 
Well, the biggest logistical difference is mainly the expense of getting there. It's a, you can't fly there. Um, there's no easy way of getting there. The remoteness, though, is, is, is all part of the appeal. It's just lovely to, to be somewhere that far from anywhere else. I mean, when um, Brian Davison and I, back in 1990, we made the first ascent of a, a mountain called Mount Cass, and we, we stood on the summit, the sun was setting, we were on this great glaciated mountain, sun setting over the Southern Ocean, and I thought, well, we've got three companions about 15 miles away sitting in a snow cave. There was a tiny army garrison about 30 miles away. And other than that, the nearest other people were probably in the Falkland Islands, sure. 800 miles away. So you really do feel you're on the sort of edge of the world. And if we, if we say that South Georgia doesn't really count as mainland Britain, does, <laughs> um, does this country offer anything in climbing terms to a man who has stood on the highest mountain in the world? Britain? Oh, God, yeah. Yeah, the British Isles have some of the best climbing in the world. And interestingly, have produced many of the best climbers, despite... Mm. Uh, I mean, you know, people often in Switzerland, for instance, say rather lofty, well, how, how can you climb big mountaineers? You have no mountains. But they, they don't understand. But given that the, the world is basically a large rock, um, our little bit of the world has a fantastic choice of different rock types. So as a place to climb, it just has almost unrivaled variety. And, um, and of course, we're an island, so we have wonderful sea cliffs, which are, which are a joy to climb. One, perhaps... Uh, criticism that's made of climbing is that it is it can be perceived as quite a selfish passion mm. is that something which you've a view that you found yourself considering <laughs> contemplating mitigating against yeah climbing is just the self-indulgent pursuit of pleasure with a bit of pain thrown in <laughs> along the way but I don't think it serves any great noble spiritual or scientific purpose um, but I think that's one of the great attractions of it and yes, it does require an element of selfishness because by its nature, A, you're liable to be away from home for extended periods of time and, uh, and there is the possibility of dying, um, which is tough on your, your, your close friends and family. So yes, there is an element of selfishness which I think it would be, it would be naive to, to deny. Now, on that <laughs> note, thanks for your here with us today all in one piece despite despite the risks involved <laughs> however um over the years you've smashed a knee and an ankle uh and lost several toes and dislocated <laughs> the shoulder so you must have been in quite a few hospitals over the years mm. now where is the worst place on earth to end up in hospital well um i have to be very careful here because <laughs> I've, I've had bad experiences in my local nhs hospital <laughs> so I, and also very good experiences but i've had problems with callow young registrars uh, failing to realise that there were post-operative wound infections and I was about to lose my leg, but that's a, that's a long story. And probably the best actually was um, you alluded to a, a, a very nasty accident I had in the Himalayas uh, oh, and I broke both my legs, including badly smashing my right knee, which is inconvenient at, at uh, 18,000 feet. And I was flown to, to a military hospital um, at a place called Bareilly, which is on the sort of northern edge of the great Indian plain, north of Delhi, at the foot of the Himalayas. And I arrived there, plucked from a glacier, having not really eaten for four days. And they were absolutely wonderful. You know, they, they x-rayed me, they did an immediate diagnosis of what the problems were. So the sub-Himalayan plains over the JR any day then? <laughs> well, hospitals vary. <laughs> you know, Outside of climbing circles, if there was one person who you could take up a Himalayan peak with you, who would it be? Uh, most people have got better things to do and have no desire to go up a mountain. Yeah, the, pe the, people, the people I admire are not generally mountaineers, because what we do is not very, very sort of worthy or worthwhile, um, but hugely enjoyable. Uh, people I really admire are musicians, because if, if I had the skill and talent, I'd love to be a musician. And uh, I, I think if I was going to be anyone, I'd want to be Paul Lewis, who's a, uh, he's, he's a brilliant concert pianist. It'd be very interesting to meet him and take him up a climb, so maybe that's who I should, I should take. But he'd probably be very worried about damaging his fingers. <laughs> <laughs> Tonight we're going to be packed out with, um, with aspiring mountaineers. Hope so. <laughs> and um, what, would your, what would your final tip to them be? Oh, don't do it. <laughs> Simple. <laughs> it's not good for you.
I'm Stephen, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Thank you. This is Jamie Gardner, reporting for Charwell TV.